Recording in progress. Very good. Well, good afternoon, everyone, on a, a warm, always special Monterey evening. Welcome to our city council meeting. Whether you're watching it live on YouTube or you're going to watch it later on, uh, you can also access it by computer. And I guarantee you it's the best show in town. Before we start, I'm going to turn it over to our amazing city clerk, uh, Clementine, who's going to share with uh, folks how uh, they can participate in their meeting. I think by now we're pretty good about these hybrid meetings, but it always uh, is nice to have a reminder. So Clementine, would you share that with the uh, our viewing public, please? Certainly. For the safe attendance of our public meetings, um, if you're in our council chamber, masks are required for all who attend in person, regardless of vaccination status, except those who are younger than two or have a medical condition that prevents wearing a mask. Please keep your phones and devices muted in the chamber to prevent audio interference. And there are two ways to virtually, virtually participate in today's meeting. You may join us using the Zoom app on your computer or mobile device, and you can also call into the Zoom meeting. To join the meeting on Zoom on your computer, smartphone, or telephone, use the link or phone number on the agenda at iSearchMonterey.org. An up-to-date version of Zoom software must be used. To call in by telephone, dial toll-free 833-568-8864, then enter meeting ID 160-772-9333, pound. And if prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound. Detailed instructions on using and updating Zoom are available at monterey.org slash public meetings. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you dialed in by phone, raise your hand by dialing star nine and then unmute yourself when called upon by dialing star six. You must do both. Public commenters will be muted until it is their turn to speak. I will call on each public speaker in the order of their hands raised. Please stay within the time limit established for today's meeting and a countdown timer will be shown on the screen. If you're connected live on Zoom, the timer is ac accurate with no delay. Today's meeting is also streamed live on the city's YouTube account at youtube.com slash city of Monterey with about 10 seconds delay and on Comcast channel 25 up to 90 seconds delay. And as always, we look forward to receiving your public comment. Thank you, very well done. Let's uh, call the meeting to order. And Clementine, would you please show the flag above Colton Hall for us? And there it is. And I invite everyone to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And then, uh, Clementine, you know the routine. Now, would you please <laughs> introduce your caring city council? Yes. Councilmember Albert. Here. Councilmember Hoffa. Here. Councilmember Smith. Here. Councilmember Williamson. Here. And Mayor Roberson. And I'm here as well. And so we will go ahead and get started with public comments. And these public comments allow the public to speak for a maximum of three minutes on any subject within the jurisdiction of the Monterey City Council, and that is not on the agenda. If you have a comment about the agenda, we will we'll be sure to give you that opportunity to share at that time. So with that, again, if you leave a contact, or if you don't care to do that right now, you can simply email at suggest at monitoring.org, and our very competent staff will get back to you. Uh, with any answers that you might need. With that, do we have anyone in the council chambers who would like to make a public comment about not on the agenda? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for, Mayor, Mayor, there is one member of the audience. Yes, there's that, one member. All right. Well, let's welcome that person. And this uh, is their. We have, we have a few. Uh, please, please, please come on up. It's a little awkward having some of us online and some of us in the chambers but we're doing our best we can all right we ready to go good to yeah go. welcome hi my name is michael johnson i'm 
here trying to get some speed control on municipal war two. There just doesn't seem to be any. Hmm. I'll fly by that out down that wharf at mock speed. And I've done a couple of requests to see how many tickets have been issued on that wharf. And the police chief could probably agree with me. That number is zero ever. Um, I've had personal experience where I'm standing at the back of my car with my dog on a leash and it's got run over. Oh. Um, that was before. I just think that there needs to be a way to control the speed on that wharf. Seeing how the police don't seem to be able to handle it. Maybe speed bumps. I also talked to the traffic control officer about it and he says maybe one of those electronic signs that show your speed. My concern mm -hmm. with that is how many people are going to try to break that thing by going 130 miles an hour down the wharf. My car will do this fast going down the wharf. I think that needs to be fixed. Do you agree, sir? Um, may I ask you a question, sir? Sure. And is this the general public or are these people yes. who work or are, are run the concessions? Who's doing the speeding in your opinion? If you can share that with us. 90% if... or it's the general public. 10% huh. or the maybe some of the fish companies, delivery drivers. Right now, does this happen in the park, the general parking it's area? Before, wharf before, too. I'm sorry, before oh, you- Oh, Wharf 2, yes, there's parking. No, I understand there. Wharf 2, is it happen where all the parking is before you actually get it towards the okay. warehouse? Well, cool. all the way down. Okay. All the, all the way down. Well, thank you for asking our questions. That will help us, thank you. I just really think this needs to be fixed. Got it. I mean, I don't want to start throwing bricks, but I may. Thank you. All right. Do we have others in the chamber who'd like to share yes, their we thoughts do, with we us? We do have a member of the public approaching the podium. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Honorable Mayor, City Council members. My name is Jacqueline C. Simon. I'm a professor, I teach business. I'm elected official in this county as well. I'm in the fire safety protection area, 125 square miles of Monterey County. Um, I'm vice president of North County Fire Protection District. Mm. I'm not here for that reason. I'm here more uh, in support of the uh, EV chargers that you're uh, thinking of putting in different places throughout Monterey County. Uh, the place that I understand that you're considering is in the wharf area parking. So I'm not in support of that. Um, I've seen what Salinas looks like in the Target parking, and that many EV chargers in that area would almost make it look like a extension uh, of a uh, gas station uh, or a lot, because those areas there are 17 in that area right now in Salinas. It just looks horrific. It's uh, a detriment, I think, for the area. I have many businesses that I invite in internationally um, in my business of uh, entrepreneurism and strategic planning. Many of them come in from out of town. And um, I would like to make sure we're able to park in that parking lot because many times, because it's so crowded now, even not that being passed, you have to park almost across the street and then try to dive in between cars to get across that uh, street in order to get into the parking area. So I'm in support of it. I believe in business. I believe in economic opportunity. The tax base related to that will probably be pretty positive and good for the, the community. I'm in support of that. I'm in support of business, but I just like it in another place. I was thinking, uh, my family's been here for over 60 years um, and uh, we it's a beautiful community. Uh, one area that we know very well because we have uh, members of our family that are buried in the Elistero area there. Uh, I think there's Elistero Lake area near the Chamber of Commerce building, which I think will be excellent for that effort. As a professor, you look at the big picture. To me, this parking EV charger area will be a destination to visit just as all of the wonderful restaurants that are in the uh, parking area near the parking area, like uh, Fisherman's uh, Grotto and, and a few of the other awesome, um, you know, restaurants that have been here for many, many years. So I wouldn't want them to be hindered if 
so many people continue to come in, lock up all those areas, and then we have to find other places to park, or there may not be a lot of additional places to park. So I'm in support of it. I think it's a great idea, economically speaking. I'm an entrepreneurial professor, taught many years in that area all over the world and in California. So I'm in support of it, but Ellis Park would be probably the better place. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks for your comments and for everyone. Uh, that's going to be a topic in closed session, so we appreciate you making your input right now. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. There are no done deals. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Mayor, we do have uh, more speakers. Yes. Here we go. How do I start? Here, go ahead. Hi, my name is Joanne Chris. I'm a multi-property owner in Monterey. I am firmly in support of both clean energy and of the fiscal transparency the city touts. Today, I express the following comments and concerns. Despite Tesla's claims of CCS compatibility, which would allow for non-Teslas to be charged, disability is currently limited in the US. City residents have been advised that it is likely the supercharger will be compatible. CCS compatibility must be demanded of Tesla. In June 22, Tesla commenced the construction of an eight stall supercharger at Laguna Seca Racetrack. These superchargers are in addition to 14 at the Del Monte Mall, six in Seaside, 12 in Sand City, one in Pebble Beach, and 12 in Marina. I would think that all these superchargers within a 10 mile range of Monterey would provide enough capacity for Tesla owners. The city, while defiling the historic Wharf Custom House Plaza area, is acting against one of its value drivers, as the supercharging station clearly does not preserve or protect these historic areas. Has this been considered? Our city manager has indicated that 100% of the city of Monterey's energy is clean. Has the city contracted with the party other than PG&E, as PG&E does not make this claim? Yeah. Any superchargers installed and not directly powered by solar energy merely result in less energy available on the grid, which serves the city as well as other parts of California and even the balance of the country. Power is fungible, but unless replaced, it is lost. Superchargers consistent with the green values of Monterey must be powered by Tesla powered solar energy. Otherwise, we the residents will suffer at the benefit of Tesla owners. I ask if the city has considered alternate providers of EV charging, such as Electrify America or EVGo. Electrify America is the choice of the VW group, as well as, as a Hyundai Kia Genesis group, the two groups gaining market share on Tesla. This appears to be a project that should have gone to competitive bid. Unfortunately, it seems that because Tesla approached the city, they will be awarded the contract. Why is it that all residents may have may obtain is the approval of negotiations between the city and Tesla. Are we not, as the parties for whom you work, entitled to know what the city will gain from this contract? Mr. Usler has stated the city will operate superchargers, yet Tesla states that they own and operate their network of superchargers. Thus, what are the city's financial benefits from ceding numerous parking spots along with landscaping to Tesla? And how does this compare to paid parking on weekends and other prime time? The residents of Monterey are entitled to answers to these and any other questions before council enters into a contract. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, we have one more speaker. All right, I always welcome public comment. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you about the Tesla's charger. I suggest that you ask yourself a few questions as follows. The US EV market is made up of 37 major companies with some familiar names, including in Alpha Order, Chevrolet, Ford, Hyundai, Kia, Lucid, Tesla, and Toyota. Seven really well-known car manufacturers. You're considering a contract with just one of the seven, or more broadly, one of 37 EV manufacturers. Ask yourself, why is this? I look, I see no nothing in the public record that shows any evidence of due diligence. Is this an, uh, an instance of major discrimination 
or is it an instance of major favoritism? Isn't this contrary to the city of Monterey values? The raw material needed fuel and EV is <clears throat> electricity. <clears throat> um, how are the proposed chargers going to obtain the requisite raw material? It's been suggested that Monterey gets 100% of its energy, electrical energy, from uh, green sources. Somebody ought to tell PGE on the public record, PGE says 53% of its energy is uh, green production. So, where's the other 47% coming from? Whether green or not, California is going to suffer and is suffering a shortage of uh, available electricity. This shortage, or availability shortage, is highlighted by Governor Newsom's recent call to residents to limit their use of electricity between 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. I went out to Del Monte Mall last night and looked at the charger areas. There are 14 charger Tesla charger slots. 10 of them were being used at 7 p.m. How does that make you feel? Well, I'm not going to tell you how I really felt, but it made me pretty unhappy and it should make you pretty unhappy. We weren't conserving energy so that Tesla owners could use the energy. Is that the kind of activity that you want to encourage? Well, if so, you can maybe you can uh, read an ordinance and say, well, no charging between four and nine. Okay, and then you can have Chief Hoover hire uh, a special charger enforcement officer. I know Chief Hoover uh, just a little bit. He's a fantastic guy, and he would not waste city resources that way. Finally, I want to know why this matters to me heard in closed session. I know uh, personal matters, always in closed session. Um, you have uh, litigation matters, always in closed session. Real estate matters, yeah, sometimes. Let's talk about the real estate. A tiny sliver of real estate on the war. It's beginning. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, that appears to be the end of the public comment. So All please. right, then we'll ask Clementine, is there anyone online who wanted to uh, yes. speak during this open mic session of the council, please? Yes, we do have some hands raised and I see the first is Beth Fabinski. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. My name is Beth Fabinski, and I'm an engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and a new residence of the city of Monterey. My main question is, I would like the council to provide a status on their climate action plan and greenhouse gas inventory um, in the near time, in the near future. My uh, second comment is I'm representing the Citizens Climate Lobby of Monterey and Mike Clancy, the president when I say that the need for electrification of transportation is so urgent that we support the EV charging station, but also support uh, non-Tesla DC fast charges be installed in the immediate future. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Beth, for your information. I'm also a member of CCL and we will be having a study session uh, in October uh, about the city's uh, climate action plan, and we'll make sure everybody uh, gets invited. Uh, next, we have a telephone caller with the last three digits, 500. Please go ahead. Hello, it's Wendy Brickman. You can hear me? Yes, we can, Wendy. Hi. Hi, how are you? <laughs> anyway, I'm representing... Fisherman's Wharf Association to share our response to your planning to eliminate 17 parking spaces located in the waterfront lot and replace them with Tesla supercharging stations. While we fully support electric cars and charging stations, we cannot, however, support losing 17 more parking spaces. We also don't want a gas station appearance in the parking lot that is adja adjacent to the harbor in Monterey Bay in the coastal zone. As you're aware, in the past, many parking spaces were already eliminated with the replacement, reconfiguration, and upgrades to the waterfront lot that included the new trash compactor building. So parking has become even more valuable to the wharf merchants as waterfront visitors continue to grow. 
along with the increase in the amount of Custom House Plaza event bookings and the daily Magic Theater performances, so it intensifies the demand for parking. We have not received any requests for car charging stations from our visitors over the past decade. The waterfront continues to be a popular place to visit, and when all of the waterfront businesses are fully leased out and operational, it will add more visitors to the wharf and other waterfront businesses that will increase parking demands. We respectfully, again, request that you consider alternative areas for the supercharging stations adjacent to the waterfront parking lot that would be much less impactful to existing parking availability there. Thank you. All right, and next we have Chris Shake. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. We can hear you. Okay. Hi, my name is Chris Shake, and uh, I want to thank you for your efforts to add more EV charging stations in the city of Monterey. As our city manager stated, the path towards electric cars is clearly marked. While I do not disagree with Hans, I would like to see more involvement and participation with our citizens of Monterey, especially with the stakeholders. I'm struggling to understand why our city manager and staff agree that the waterfront parking lot is the best location to remove 17 parking spaces and replace them with Tesla charging stations. I hope you will consider other locations like the Chamber of Commerce building parking area at Alistair Lake or the Dust Bowl Brewery parking lot. I just don't want to see something as beautiful as our waterfront parking area to look like a car fueling station. Thank you. Thank Sorry. you, Chris, for calling in. And speaking of calling, we do have another telephone caller with the last three digits, 204. You can go ahead, please. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Tom Rowley, R-O-W-L-E-Y, uh, President Fisherman's Flats uh, Homeowners and Residents Association. I want to reiterate the invite for the candidates forum on Monday, uh, September 19th at the Living Hope Church. Uh, doors open at 6.30 for social and to meet the uh, candidates. Our meeting starts promptly at seven. And um, I'm hoping that um, everyone will be able for the Flats and Foothills area of Monterey, which includes Monterey Woods, 48 units, plus uh, Deer Flats Park, and also the neighborhoods that are in par part of Monterey that are along Jocelyn Canyon. Anyway, um, you're all invited. Those that can't make it to any of the other neighborhood um, uh, candidate forums are certainly invited. That's on Monday. September 19th, uh, doors open 6.30. The, our meeting starts promptly at seven. So thanks a lot. And um, new subject, Wendy Brickman and Chris Shake are absolutely right. Uh, shouldn't be a closed session. And the chamber parking lot is not, not a desirable place to stick uh, any kind of parking, long-term parking. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom, before you leave, if you're still with us, this is Mayor Clyde. Is there Zoom access or any other way to go to that meeting, but only in person? It's only in person. Okay, thank you, Tom. Okay, glad you make, can make it. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay. All right, and looks like we have um, Esther Malkin. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to um, join in with those that are opposing the Tesla chargers, but for a different reason. Our area is um, constantly daily bombarded with workers commuting into our city that are causing the carbon footprint to increase as well as the traffic, which everybody, including tourists, complain about. And those workers that are commuting here are commuting here because they can't afford to live near where they work. 
Now we have 66% of those residents in this city are renters. And I can guarantee you that a small fraction might someday ever be able to afford a Tesla. And while they're trying to pay their rent, if they're lucky enough to be able to afford an electric vehicle, they should have the opportunity to charge their vehicles as residents, the majority of residents, as well as the workers that supposedly businesses and the city care so much about that they claimed, you know, during the pandemic to care so much about them. But here we're kind of going back to the old mentality that they're really not that at the top priority. So I would encourage the city council to not participate with Tesla and other companies that are that elitist because it simply continues to feed the reputation of our city among our, some of our neighboring cities that we are elitist. When I first moved here 20 years ago, I heard that mentioned about the city of Monterey and I didn't understand that while I was living in Monterey. I didn't feel like it was elitist. But now that I'm here all this time and I've heard it repeated at, in the context of we don't build affordable housing in our city because we want other cities to do it for us, I really think that it would be detrimental to continue to feed that reputation of our city especially when it comes to something like climate change, which gets um, so much attention. And the workers are the ones that really ultimately need that those, those electric vehicles way more than the people who could afford to pay these astronomical gas prices. So keep in mind that the renters are the majority of the residents in this city and they should be considered first and foremost. Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, we do not have any further um, hands raised at this time on Zoom. All right, there you go. I'm, uh, my rat terrier, normally I would be in my study upstairs, but it's too hot. So Gracie, my rat terrier is, is an active participant in our meeting. And that's why I have to mute my microphone every so often. And so thank you for your forbearance. Yeah, that's right, you stop it, dog. <laughs> Good luck with that. But we do, again, we will be discussing all of these uh, suggestions and elements uh, during uh, our closed session. And it's in closed session, by the way, because it's uh, a lease, which are qualified to be closed session items. So thank you for your input. Council's taking a look at this for the first time, and we will, I'm sure, have a really vigorous discussion as we always do. So with that, we'll go to the consent. Do we know if there's anyone uh, from the public who wanted to pull a consent item now? Uh, we do have one. And uh, if uh, we could ask uh, Eloise Shim to come up to the podium to speak on the consent item that she would like to pull, that would be helpful. All right, we don't know which one it is then, yeah. All right, why don't we go, no no one else that we know, anyone online, Clementine, who wanted to pull a consent item? Hello, is which item you want to pull? No, I there are no hands raised. Mr. Okay, so and why don't we go ahead and have our item friend Eloise line, share. I don't her, know. I'm sorry, Hans, what are, we, what are we doing? I just wanted to clarify, Eloise likes to pull item number nine of the consent agenda. Okay, we'll go ahead and pull item nine then, and before we get to it, uh, Council, any uh, questions, comments about the other consent? Uh, Mayor, just a, a quick comment on item number 10 and all the others. Uh, I'm ready to make a motion. All right, why don't you make a motion and include your comment on about number 10 while you're at it, please, except uh, excluding number nine, of course. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. A motion to approve of the consent agenda as, as the presented by staff uh, with the exception of number nine, we'll poll and number 10, a comment. Second. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, Councilmember Ed, you have the floor on item 10, please. Yes. I just wanted to highlight uh, this is another significant uh, piece of project and work by our staff. Uh, for those uh, who have not reviewed the packet in front of you, it's number 10 is the prepared, uh, Andre 
and wow. Rainey, our interim public works director and her fine staff. So they are uh, submitting the results of open bidding and we are awarding tonight uh, the bid contract uh, in the amount of, bear with me while I'm looking for the amount here, of uh, 1055000 uh, with uh, the range of $1.125 And this is for a project phase three. Uh, so it's a follow-on with projects that are continuing to flow through the city of Monterey street improvements uh, and work as a result of the public's vote of uh, Measure S. So I just wanted to uh, call that out and say uh, that the work for our streets um, work is continuing, and this is one of the additional measures uh, moving forward as the project is being awarded tonight. So I just want to thank the members of the public that are so patient for their streets that are seeing uh, improvements. And I think when we look around the, the city, we've seen in the last two years significant work in our uh, pavement index uh, ratings is continually going up. So I just didn't want this to get buried and wanted to say thank you to Public Works staff and their work and the patients to the city uh, residents that voted for Measure S. And that's all, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Ed, well said. Any other comment on the motion? If not, roll call, please. Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Williamson. Yes. Council Member Albert. Yes. Council Member Hoffa. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. Yes, that passes uh, five zero. Now, on item nine, I'm going to ask our very capable uh, city manager to give a, just a brief thumbnail explanation of what this action is, and we'll invite Eloise to make her comments. So, Hans, we'll turn it to you, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is just uh, an item that allows the city of Monterey to contract together with the county of Monterey uh, to allow uh, our law enforcement agencies to participate in the statewide California fingerprinting identification system. Okay. Well, then we'll open it for public comment and then invite anyone who wants to speak on this to come forward, and either with questions or comments. Great, and Eloise is here at the podium and we'll start her timer now. All right. Okay, so um, I'm Eloise Shim and I wanted to comment about this um, biometric technology, um, the automatic fingerprint identification system. Um, I myself is a person who worked for 12 years at MPUSD and another three years I worked at a retirement community. I know that most people working with the public need to have their fingerprints taken at, for in one reason or, an, or another. And um, the process for me, because I don't have very thick ridges on my fingerprints, is pretty mm -hmm. torturous. and. Uh, I have to endure it. But what I want to say is I don't I think that not many people know that uh, they know the pro the pros of that biometric technology, but they don't really contemplate the cons of it. And some of the cons of it are that there is a lack of accuracy, which can lead to failure. There's a big privacy issue. That's the biggest issue. Um, and I'm thinking that if you pass this, that law enforcement will be able to take your fingerprints if they stop you. Is that true or not? Or do you just have access to the database? Okay. Anyway, once the information is hacked, it can lead to many serious uh, consequences in the database. There are errors in the biometric devices, which appear like a false rejection or acceptance. Um, there are circumstances where the device rejects a user who is an authorized person. It's, a, it's very expensive. It involves a large cost in getting the system up and running. Um, the integration in another is another issue which is complex and makes the technology invasive. An individual can feel very uncomfortable if they're unsure if the person is authorized to properly capture the individual data. 
Um, it can cause injury to the fingerprint during the verification process. The technology can be used to replicate and steal a person's identity. Um, it's a fairly short distance, which has to be kept by a person to get the exact reading. Um, and there's just another, a false identity can occur if the algorithm is incorrect. So there's a lot of cons with this biometric technology. And I think that people just aren't, don't consider it and aren't aware of it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Eloise. And any other public comment? All right, we'll bring it back to the council. Um, Mayor, I just one comment as I read the staff report and knowing that I'm pretty familiar with the history of this, this is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, I'm not sure uh, some of the ideas we just heard from the speaker is uh, entirely accurate. Uh, this is an agreement between all the uh, law enforcement agencies on the peninsula, and it's, it's simply a furtherance of what's been happening now. Most generally, the fingerprints are captured through live scan, uh, and each agency does it in their own manner. The live scan is submitted uh, to the criminal justice uh, system and for verification of identification. This is uh, not overly technical. Uh, in the old days, folks may have to come into uh, a location records and have their fingerprints uh, taken with uh, the black ink. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's not how it's done anymore. Um, so it's uh, not very intrusive and pretty simple. And so it's like you're putting your fingers on top of the uh, the glass of a of a printer with a technician that's uh, closely adhering to all the rules and regulations. So uh, I I'm still very comfortable with this approval of this agenda. All right. I'll, I'll make questions? a motion to approve. All right. We have a motion and I'll second it. Other discussion? A roll call, please. Councilmember Williamson? Yes. Councilmember Hoffa? Yes. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Albert? Yes. And Mayor Robertson? Yes. That carries 5 0. All right. Let's go to our public hearing. And that's that the council adopted amendment to the 2019-2020 annual action plan for our CDBG grant funds and to submit them to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And as I pointed out in our staff report, the city works very closely following the directions of uh, HUD, which does have um, pretty restrictive uh, uses of these funds. And, I know as mayor over the years, I've, I've seen a number of letters going back and forth to make sure that we're in compliance with everything. And so we're spending the money uh, correctly. Back to our capable city manager for a quick overview, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I will not give you a quick capable overview because that will steal the thunder from Grant uh, if I would try to summarize it. So with that, I give it to Grant. Well, we wouldn't want to steal any thunder from Grant, that's for sure. We don't, absolutely not. <laughs> All right, Grant, welcome. Excellent. Thank you, City Manager, Mayor, and Council. Tonight we are having a public hearing to act on a substantial amendment to accept an additional $105,000 in CARES Act Community Development Block Grant funding. So as we are all painfully aware, in early 2020, COVID-19 came to America. And rather quickly, Congress had passed the CARES Act by March of 2020. And within that act included several billion dollars in community development block grant funding. Uh, this was apportioned to cities across America by allocation. And the city of Monterey received our first allocation in the spring of 2020 at 152,000. And a second allocation in the fall of 2020 at just under 400,000. At this time, the cities used the funding to respond to uh, emergency rental assistance um, due to so many people being laid off at the time and being unable to pay their rent. This was a prudent use of funding during that time period. Uh, we expended all of our CARES Act Community Development Block Grant funding by February of 2021, so less than a year um, 
between when it was first authorized and when we expended our last CARES Act dollar. And the reason we need a substantial amendment um, is a HUD regulation. So whenever there's a HUD regulatory change to an action plan or we change an allocation to uh, fund new programs or to add a new program, we need to go through a public hearing process mm -hmm. in order to make sure that um, the funds are being used wisely and that the public is aware of their use. So in this case, the city of Monterey has been awarded an additional 105,960 apologies for the typo on the uh, presentation here. It's 105, not 104. Mm -hmm. That money is to be used to prevent, prepare, prepare for, or to respond to COVID-19. And Monterey is one of only 22 cities nationwide to receive this additional allocation. Other cities are still struggling to use their initial allocation, and many other cities have actually turned down their second allocation, which is how this additional funding became available to us. Staff is recommending the funding be used for new and improved public service grants. As you know, uh, may recall rather, the traditional block grant funding we receive every year has a limit on how much can be spent on public services, that's 15%. However, that limit is waived with CARES Act funding so that nonprofits mm -hmm. can devote more funding to responding to the COVID-19 emergency. So that would be a prudent uh, way to spend the funding and also would be able to allocate the full amount to that. The proposed timeline involves city approval of the substantial amendment tonight, followed by HUD approval by the end of the month. And then we are going to include this funding in our usual um, application process for our nonprofits. So that begins in November when we release a notice of funding availability. Applications are then received in December. Those are reviewed in January and we prepare our annual action plan in February, which is released prior to going to the planning commission and then the council in April. So we'll approve the funding tonight and then it will roll into our usual funding program uh, that will streamline it administratively and also make it easier for our nonprofits. They only have to apply for the funds one time instead of having an additional application process. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you, Grant, well done. And um, when you were mentioning public service, this, this additional funding would go to uh, public service grants. And then I think at the end of your presentation, you mentioned nonprofits. Can you uh, just explain for the public, please, what public service grants are and where this money would be might be going? Absolutely. The public service grants are grants that are given out to nonprofit organizations within that serve the city of Monterey. So traditionally, we fund um, Meals on Wheels, Food Bank of Monterey County, Gathering for Women, Interim. Uh, and many others, community human services. We fund about 10 to 11 nonprofits every year through this program. And so uh, that's an interchangeable term, uh, public service grant versus nonprofit grant. They mean the same thing. I'm very good. I think they will be delighted to have some additional funding. Other council questions, please? I have a question, Mayor. Yes, Council Member Dan. So it's, it's only restricted to public service uh, grants is it what if a city a city has a program they'd like to put in rental assistance of some type in the future can they can we use this funds also uh, the restriction is that it be used to prevent prepare for or to respond to COVID-19 and looking at our staff program and what the city had planned uh, we thought it would be best to go out to the nonprofits. but yes if the city had an eligible use to prevent to prepare or to respond to COVID-19, we so, could use that. So if there's an, an initiative in the future, we could use this funds if seen, seen appropriately if we had to. Well, at the moment, this would approve it to go out to the public service grants as opposed to city use. Okay. Okay, other questions? Mayor, Council Mayor. Member Tyler? Yes, Council Member Tyler, please. I'd just like to follow up on uh, Dan's question. So technically speaking, we could use the funds for an emergency rental assistance program, the funds that we're voting on today, is that accurate, Grant? That's correct. That's how we'd use the prior allocations. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Um, All right, so, well, uh, Mayor, just one. one yes, Council Member Ed, please. 
comment. Um, Grant, could you put the timeline back up on the on the screen? That would be helpful. I I think with the process of what we're doing tonight is that we're receiving this amount of money, but the next step is that uh, we have to say yes to HUD, and and then we put it into the cycle of releasing the CDBG public service grant application. So if other council members are thinking of a different way to use this, I, I would suspect that we need to establish that uh, in the September 23rd meeting. Is that correct? Uh, so the September 23rd date is when HUD will approve it, uh, okay. their Fort Worth office in Texas. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so I'm just uh, it, cognizant of the fact that there may be some other ideas that we have heard tonight, but if we are uh, if staff is recommending that this goes back to the service award to the nonprofits, that's the idea tonight or today. And if it's going to be suggested to do something else, when is the time frame you need to have that as a motion from council members to make any other changes on that 105000 well, it would be before the April date. Okay. Uh, that would be when the action plan is approved. Okay. And as we're doing a substantial amendment tonight, you can always substantially amend uh, this action plan. So you could come back to this topic if there's a city initiative proposed. Okay, so I just wanted to be aware of the timeline and that the ideas that we talked about briefly tonight may come back and make some ultimate recommendations. And you're saying the April uh, 2023 council approval is the time that we may have modifications. Exactly. Okay. But, Thank you. Appreciate the time. But also a qu another question, Mayor. But that would mean if we allocate funds to the uh, the service providers, and then we come back to amend that, that means we have to pull back that funding from those service providers to to uh, to supply funds for uh, a new initiative from the city. I would think that's what it means. Uh, yes. So there's the hundred and five thousand. Either it right. goes uh, completely to the nonprofits, or right. it's split between nonprofits and a city initiative. So if we, we make amendment to that, then we would have to go back to those service providers and pull the money out, I would assume. Well, they'll be applying through that in November through April timeframe. So that's when you'll see their applications and decide whether to fund them or I, not. Thank you. Okay, good. Council Member Tyler, you had another question. I, I think it just goes right to, to what Dan was asking. So it sounds like to me, we probably need to decide tonight so that we're not stringing along folks that might be applying for the grants. Is that accurate to say, Grant? Sorry, that I didn't mean to do two different grants in the same sentence. <laughs> no, that's a that's a professional hazard for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, as I said, in the April time frame, that's when you'll receive the the review of all the applications for the funding and decide yes to fund it or no to fund it. Um, so, really, tonight is needed so that we can get the hundred and five thousand from HUD because um, we're on a tight timeline to get it approved by September 23rd. So yeah, and just, just to answer Councilman Williamson's question, we are not stringing them along yet. Uh, so uh, <laughs> that uh, that starts uh, basically with the process of sending us their grant applications. And then when we are awarding it, we should award at that time uh, based on the latest guidance from the council, whether we include the $105,000 or not. There are two components always from the CDBG. We always get uh, an allocation that allows us to do public service grants, rain or shine. This is just another extra $105,000 that we are proposing to allocate to that because there is a definite need uh, by, by those uh, service providers. Having said all that, uh, I just wanted to be clear, they are not being strung around yet. Uh, so we, we there's still time to uh, review the applications and then allocate the funding as the council likes to allocate it at that time, either including the 105 or minus the 105. Okay, so, thank you. One last comment, Mayor. Uh, yes. Even though, even though we could uh, allocate in the next uh, month or two uh, funds or at least uh, direct funds to the service providers, it doesn't necessarily mean that we uh, fully fund what they're asking for, I would assume. And then we can pull money out if we have to on any initiatives that we have. Well, the funding cycle has concluded. So the, 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 the service providers current funding cycle is closed with the budget, with the approved budget. Mm -hmm. Before you is a new funding cycle. Uh, here are the timeline again that, that, that Grant is showing you. So right now, uh, 
everyone should be satisfied with the awards and then comes a new process and again at that time council can decide whether you want to include the 105 or not okay as long as we have some options and it sounds like we do yeah sounds like that to me as well let's uh good uh, excellent questions and mr leonard everybody likes grants so you're you're doing fine and let's uh, see if there's public comment in the council chambers. <clears throat> no, now, no comments from members of the public here in council. And chamber. Clementine, any public comments online, please? Yes, we do. We have Esther Malkin. So, all Esther, right, welcome back. Go ahead, please. Hello again. So, I have attended at least five CDBG meetings the last couple of years that the city has put and the funds have always been from CDBG given out to these nonprofits who, whoa, we're getting a silver alert on my phone. Um, and so all of these nonprofits obviously are very well deserving of those funds and they do great work. Um, in the past, advocates have asked this City for a renter assistance program long before the pandemic happened, long before anybody even knew what the word COVID-19 was. The pandemic proved that what we had been asking for for years in the form of a renter assistance program was absolutely necessary. Now, again, are you willing to go back to treating renters the way that you did before? Pandemic, and just because they've been, some of them have been rebranded as essential, they are still the ones that are most at risk of becoming homeless. I strongly urge you to continue giving the money that you've given these nonprofits to in the past in the same amounts. But if this is the first and only opportunity that you finally have a new pot of money to dedicate to renter assistance for our city, non-pandemic related, this is probably going to be the only time that you're going to be able to use funds like this for that. So while everybody works on these great services and programs to help people once they become homeless, the number one tool to prevent people from becoming homeless is to help the rent situation, which this council refuses to address, but at least if you have this money before you and you can create the program which was proven to be necessary, we spent the money that we had during the pandemic. This is a one shot that you guys should take advantage of and create a program that has been sorely needed and very much so to include a lot of the renters that were excluded by the HUD recommendations that are in place whenever it comes to using these, these programs that are set up. So again, you've got 66% of the people in this city are renters, zero representation. And this is an opportunity for this council to show that they actually care about the residents and workers that are the majority. Thanks. All right, and I don't see any further speakers, Mr. Mayor. Take uh, that section of the public hearing and bring it back to the council. I think you've heard uh, the staff's explanation, giving the council flexibility. Um, should you adopt the staff recommendation or if you want to go in a different direction, this is uh, a chance to express that as well. So what is your pleasure? A move to approve. A second. All right. Any more discussion? I have yes. something. Council Member Allen, please. Uh, yeah, so um, certainly the idea of a rental assistance program is something that I have been in favor of for mm -hmm. a while. Um, whether or not this pot of money is the right pot of money to fund it, I think is something we'll have a better, uh, better, better information to determine. Um, personally, I would rather see us have a sustainable source of money for a rental assistance program, not a kind of one year pot of money. Mm -hmm. And I believe if we do end up moving forward with um, 
cannabis dispensaries, that could be part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so also it's possible that some of the nonprofits will um, propose their own rental assistance program. A number of them have had and have rental assistance programs. So mm -hmm. it's not like it's an either or. I think I would also just note that the nonprofits the city supports don't only support homelessness, although to be honest, that is the most um, pressing issue in, in my judgment. It's where, uh, it's where we see a lot of issues for all segments of our community and, and our residents are affected by it. Um, but Meals on Wheels, um, the food bank um, that serve um, elderly people, low-income elderly people. There are programs that the city supports that serve um, disabled or uh, people. So it isn't like, I think there's just a misunderstanding. And uh, this is great news because almost always the nonprofits who um, apply to the city for these grants ask for much more than we're able to give them. And the need is tremendous. So um, if it does come up that if it does turn out, you know, uh, in a few months that we have no other source of money um, and we we want to we want to create our own rental assistance program again, we can do that. This action tonight doesn't stop us from doing that. So that's why I'm supporting the motion. Uh, yeah, very well explained. Thank you. Council member Tyler. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, Alan. I, I think the only thing I would stipulate is if there are folks, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm certain that, that, that these scenarios exist within our, our city um, that are still struggling in between now and, and the time that we actually are able to establish a, a long-term rental assistance program, um, what, what does that look like in order to provide that support to them? Um, and so it, it would be interesting if we had more data to help determine what that looked like from the city. Um, you know, how many applications were we getting at the end? Were there applications that were submitted that we weren't able to provide support because we ran out of funding? Um, how much would we estimate would actually be needed for a program over the next year? Um, some of this information would be helpful just to weigh that when this discussion comes back up later this year. But um, I agree. I think let's move forward with the action tonight and, and let's look at what opportunities look like in the future. So I appreciate your comments, Alan. Thank you, Tyler. And any other comments? Uh, Mary, just make the comment that uh, support the motion because tonight's uh, action is is not the whole. It's... Uh, you know, turn on the oven and get the get the bread in the oven. Um, we'll decide how we're going to divvy it up and divide it and butter it. And, you know, to use the analogy, because it's dinner time. Uh, <laughs> so, so we will have a time to have a, a, a really uh, robust conversation about what's the most fair and equitable way to do this. Um, so tonight is just perfunctory to move this along uh, so that our staff can go through the process that HUD requires. But we'll have some other uh, checkpoints in, in future meetings where we'll be able to you know pull out some more ideas. And I appreciate right. Grant's patience. Uh, excellent. That's the only thing I had. Yeah, and thanks. And make sure that that bread you're preparing, some of it is uh, for a certain council member's homemade pizza, okay? Yes, yes. <laughs> no GMOs and uh, organic, you bet. We're on it. We're on it. <laughs> Any other comments? <laughs> No? Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Council Member Hoffa? Yep. Council Member Albert? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? Yes. And oh, I should have mentioned earlier, aren't we just fortunate that we're able to have a really good, vigorous discussion with additional money that we've received? It's not often that that happens. And it's curious, and we don't have to answer it now, that why some jurisdictions would refuse to accept the money. That's kind of an interesting uh, twist that was pointed out. Council comments. So let's go ahead to uh, council comments. Anyone would like to start us off? Um, what's been going on in your outside commissions and committees? Yeah, I'll start, Mary. Okay, Councilmember Dan. Uh, I just have one um, 
one one to report uh, MST had a uh, town hall in Marina uh, last week on the surf project and mm -hmm. for our uh, our citizens the surf project is a uh, bus lane along highway one created so that uh, we can uh, alleviate some of the congestion on highway one in the morning and in the afternoon and it was very ironic because when I was going out to that meeting at six o'clock it took me about 20 minutes to get from Home Depot to that meeting and wow. I was going well gee uh I'm going to a meeting to alleviate this traffic that I'm in, right now, <laughs> which is very interesting. It was well attended, by the way. It had uh, at least there was at least a hundred people there, and they had stations, and you can walk around each station and find oh. out more about the project. So I, I'm really looking forward to it. I think that's going to be a, a, a real plus uh, for transportation on our our peninsula. So I'm looking forward to the surf project. Good, and thanks for serving on that board as well as being the chair. So thank you, um, Councilmember Allen. Anything this evening? Okay, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've had some encounters lately while I was on my bicycle with cars speeding very, very fast, very, very close to me. Mm -hmm. And I guess I wanted to just take the opportunity to residents who are watching this to remind them that um, people who are on bicycles have a right to, to be um, on the road. And um, that, to remember that you're in a several thousand pound vehicle and hmm. they have no protection. And um, it would be, you know, tragic, of course, if, if somebody were to be injured because you were speeding, um, you drove too close to them, you drove in a dangerous manner. And so just a reminder to drive safely in general and um, to drive respectfully of others in general and to, um, in particular, um, respect the space of people who are on bicycles. Um, and also, I guess I just really want to kind of bring up something that's kind of concerned me for a long time as someone who bikes around the city. You know, as we put in things like bulb outs, and I know mm. residents who are pedestrians like them, they feel like it slows down traffic, and it certainly makes the path across the street for when them when they cross shorter but they also create a kind of perverse situation where people mm -hmm. on bicycles are pushed out into the street yeah. and so for me that happens on soledad when i'm biking home from work there's there's a number of those there are places where there are cars parked and if if i get over on the right close to the cars the cars who are driving don't see me and they just zoom by and um and and if i drive in the center which i have a right to do mm -hmm. that's really the safest thing but um that's that that um i think that's something we have to address as we look at our long term kind of street plan and and our multimodal plan if we're going to have bulb outs there have to be cutouts for bicycles to be able to get through we shouldn't be using bicycles as a means of slowing down traffic that's not safe, it's not fair. And just in general, we have to find a way over, I'd say the next decade to um, really build a safe infrastructure for bicycles. You know, with the introduction of e-bikes, it you don't need a car to get around the peninsula. You absolutely don't. And you don't have to be in great shape or some kind of super athlete. You can be like me <laughs> and you can go anywhere, no matter how, you know, how many hills we have. But people aren't going to do it if they don't feel safe. And we have so many narrow streets and we have places where cars park and it pushes you out and we got the bulb outs and all of that. We got to look at that. So that's my comment. Thank you, Alan. Well said. Councilmember Tyler, uh, anything new from uh, Monterey One Water or other jurisdictions? I don't have any updates from uh, my outside agencies, but I would just take the moment to um, do a delayed uh, happy Labor Day to everybody and just recognizing how, how important it is for us to take a time and pause and, and recognize um, the work being done by people that are in the workforce. Um, and, and I would do a particular shout out to our city staff um, for all of the amazing services that they provide for the residents and the visitors in the city of Monterey. Um, you know, it's it's just really important that we um, we make the labor movement something that is is 
uh, a positive added value to our community as opposed to how I hear it being discussed in discourse sometimes as a burden. Um, it's not a burden. It's, it's the opportunity for the workers to have a voice, to be represented. Um, and that's a good thing, particularly when we live in a democracy. So um, I just wanted to give a shout out and, and a huge thank you to um, all those that, that are, are part of labor movement um, and, and those that wish to be. Um, there's tons of resources out there in regards to um, how to form a, a labor union if, if you're not um, currently being represented. Um, but just a little bit of a, a celebratory moment to recognize the, the, the holiday across the nation yesterday. So that's it for me. Thank you, Mayor. You're muted. Thank you, the dog again. Uh, Council Member Ed, thanks for the uh, heads up. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, two things I wanted to mention, um, September uh, 2nd, I believe it was, uh, September 2nd uh, actually marked the anniversary of the end of World War II. Uh, so for those folks, <laughs> my father and mother's generation, um, thank you. Uh, just want to recognize that 1945, September 2nd was uh, World War II end. And so never again, hopefully. Also, um, on last Tuesday, I had the privilege of uh, representing the city as the vice mayor uh, covering the Overdose and Addiction Awareness Day, uh, Tuesday at Colton Hall with a, a very robust showing of uh, the partners, the collaboration, uh, Montage, Ohana, Monterey PD, uh, County DA's office, uh, CHOMP, and a variety of about 35 other uh, collaborative partners to acknowledge and recognize the, the stigma, stigma of addiction uh, bring some awareness to it. Um, and that was the precursor to the fair the next day uh, where the Narcan kits were given out. And the whole push here is for the education with uh, and the awareness that um, the fentanyl and op opiates and the rise uh, in the attack, especially in our youth, uh, we have to combat that with education and awareness and also to combat that with the awareness that there are things that the common citizen untrained can do with a Narcon kit um, and be able to resuscitate someone. So uh, more information is there. Uh, I think if anyone wants to get that, they can contact me. They can probably go to the Monterey Police Department uh, website as well, and certainly to Montage and Chomps. Uh, educational materials. So it was a great day, great attendance, well covered by the media. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we have to continue the education to make sure that so many people that have been affected in Monterey County and across the country uh, are affected by opioids and especially right now fentanyl. And so um, keep, keep the conversations going. Make sure you have these conversations with your family and friends. And let's make sure we're we're vigilant and diligent, and we continue to educate those that are most vulnerable, and that's our teenagers, uh, to combat and fight uh, the uh, horrific battle uh, in the public of fentanyl and opioid addiction. So that was a great event, and I appreciate all the work that went into that with the city staff and the police department. And special shout out to uh, Lori Hilga from the city manager's office, who was the uh, front edge of helping that piece to to get out along with city manager, assistant city manager, uh, Nat. So thank you all to uh, those that came and the media did a good job covering it. So thank you, that's all I had. All right, thank you so much, Ed. Uh, city manager comments? Uh, yes, um, just quickly to uh, Councilmember Smith's first point. Uh, my, my father and Germany surrendered in May 1945 already. Yes. Uh, um, Parking Day announcement. Um, uh, we will celebrate Parking Day on February 16. Uh, I'm sorry, September 16 uh, on Alvarado Street. That is a celebration where we basically, with various departments from the city, show how to uh, use parking spaces instead of parked cars. 
so there will be uh, entertainment, there will be uh, various groups, police will be there, the fire department will be there, parks and recreations, uh, uh, the city clerk even will convert the parking space into something interesting for the public to see. Um, and that's all what I have right now. Uh, generally, uh, the boosters are available in local pharmacies. Mm -hmm. So latest booster uh, for Pfizer mm -hmm. is 12 years and up, and uh, Moderna is 18 years and, and up as well. So those boosters are available in local pharmacies here. And uh, of course, we encourage those uh, who, um, who are in, in need of that to get the latest booster shots. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. And on those booster shots, these new booster shots are designed to combat BA4 and 5, which is 95% of the infections right now. So it is a, a new uh, variant on the old vaccines to fight the new variant. So before we adjourn to closed session, I want to make sure that is, is there anyone in the council chambers who wanted to talk about a closed session item? We did hear earlier some folks shared about uh, Tesla. Anyone else or online who wa wants to talk about any of the closed session, items, closed session items? Not online. All right. Anyone in the chambers, Nat? No one in the chambers. All right. With that, then we'll uh, adjourn to closed session. Uh, if yeah, then at that point, we have about 15 minutes before we take our break and we can continue closed session this evening. So we'll see you all shortly on a different Zoom link. Thank you so much, as always, to the public, the staff and the council for another interesting meeting. See you shortly. Bye now.